Organising and mobilising. To understand organising, we must evaluate what it isn't. In order to do that, some of New Syndicalist's editorial team will be examining the difference between organising and mobilising in the first of a new series of podcasts, Talking Shop. As way of an introduction, we'd like to introduce the terms we'll be using in the podcast. Terms like organising and mobilising are thrown around regularly within union circles, but are often misunderstood and conflated. The most concise definitions we've seen have come from Jane McAlevey's No Shortcuts. McAlevey suggests that mobilising is based on a staff-intensive model where goals are set with little or no input from members and wins are declared after minimal progress is made towards an often overly ambitious goal. The strategy has little or no base of meaningful support, often using what she describes as authentic messengers to represent a campaign who do not have any say over the way in which the campaign is run. Those members who are involved are the usual suspects, such as already established political activists. This can often lead to burnout. The process of mobilising, run by staff or established activists, is about using those pre-existing engaged members to build visibility and a campaign that ultimately concludes in a backroom deal with only limited enforceability. Recent examples of this in the British trade union movement include the public sector strikes of 2014. In this example, we saw huge numbers of political activists brought onto the street to demand an end to austerity, a dispute which was not followed up and led entirely from the top. McAlevey describes organising as mass, inclusive and collective. This is a process which changes power structures, leading to long-term impact. This is part of a larger strategy focused on building power. Members are involved throughout, specifically organic leaders, operating independently of staff, They help build a strategy, the goals, analysis of the power structures, and negotiate any settlement. The strategy is one of targeted recruitment of specific and large numbers, leading to the withdrawal of labour through coordinated majority strikes. McAlevey suggests that this does not mean mobilising should be ignored, and can in fact be used as a tactic, but that it should never be the strategy. We've seen very limited examples of this in the trade union movement in the UK in recent times. There have been elements of this in the recent UCU strikes. But ultimately, that was led from the top and settled behind closed doors. The stronger examples have been in smaller scale campaigns, such as Deliveroo. The larger scale example has been at Picture House, where reps have taken a lead role, despite a lot of control still being held by officials. During our discussions, we'll analyse both of these definitions, examining where the grey areas are and looking over some recent campaigns. Hi, I'm Lydia. I'm um, the Women's Officer for uh, the London... IWW GMB. Um, recently, I've been involved with organising um, bar workers in South London. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Pike. I am a regional official for the National Education Union and a long time member of the IWW, also myself. Uh, the thing I've most recently been organised in is organising strikes in a, a school in Sheffield and also um, against redundancies at Hull College. Uh, Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, I am the IWW's lead education organiser. That's because also I'm a teacher, secondary school teacher. Um, I think the last thing that I've been involved with, although we do a lot of it in education, is probably um, organising or helping the organisation of a health and social care company in Sheffield um, and sort of doing work on flexibility issues and contract issues there. Go cool. so talk about what you do in your actual organising you do in your own job as no. well. No. <laughs> <laughs> just to get just to get the spirit of like McCovey straight away. Yeah, yeah. This is how to do it wrong. Yeah. And yeah. this is how you do it wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're a school teacher in education yeah. with a right. union yeah. and you're organising elsewhere. Yeah. Already you're doing it yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing loads of mobilising <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, So this is the first episode of um, Talking Shop, which is a podcast um, from the New Syndicalist. Um, The purpose of the podcast is to kind of have some discussion about key concepts for uh, organisers. We're starting off with a discussion about um, mobilising versus organising. so I think the first thing to think about is why are we making, why do we think it's important to make a distinction and to really understand the difference between these two concepts? Um, 
I think of it as something that we should be considering when we're planning a campaign so that we can kind of identify what it is that we're doing like what our what our aims are and kind of what is going to take us there um so if we if we realize that what we're planning is more of a kind of mobilization than a kind of long-term organizing strategy just um being able to identify that and think about whether that's actually what we want to be doing um is it a tactic that we're using within like a broader organizing strategy um or are we just trying to go for a kind of quick easy win which might make us feel good and you know it's good to win but um might not necessarily kind of shift the balance of power long term or kind of move us forward more generally um so thinking about how we can identify what it is that we're doing whether we're mobilizing or or doing organizing work there are some things that we can look out for so one of the things is thinking about whether the actions we're planning are symbolic or whether they're aimed at disrupting capital and shifting the balance of power in a workplace. Um, is the campaign being led by union activists or a mass of workers who choose their own leadership? Um, and a third thing, kind of among many other things, is uh, is the campaign supported by kind of the wider community, like via connection to workers themselves rather than um, kind of a less organic way of pulling in kind of other grassroots organisations. Um, so I think it's useful to think of organising as a strategy um, and mobilising as kind of one tactic within that. Um, that's been a that's been a really helpful way for me to think about these things, especially because people tend to get strategy and tactics confused as well. So I think it kind of tidies both of those things up in quite a nice way. I, I mean, I personally found these categories, I, I found them incredibly useful. But when I read uh, the book, which we haven't mentioned the book yet, actually, mm -hmm. a lot of these ideas have been drawn from uh, Jay Matthews' book, uh, No Shortcuts, which is a very good book and we'd recommend it. Uh, we have talked about it before on New Syndicalist, um, but she makes, yeah, this key categorization. And... Um, as well as finding it very useful, it immediately clarified for me a lot of things that I'd been doing and experiencing for, for a long time in the left and in the trade union movement and immediately kind of understanding what was wrong about them in a really like surgical way. In the mm. sense that like I'd been on so many demonstrations, I'd been on so many protests or even organised protests and demonstrations um, where the goal was to get like people into the street like oh we need x number of people and then it's successful or we just need like a big crowd and then it's successful or we need like x number of speakers and then it's successful and actually like having having a theory that that very clearly articulates what actually doing these things doesn't actually challenge the structures of power and i think like it's very incisive in that sense like it actually says very clearly if we want to transform society, then we need to do things that actually do shift the balance of power. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would totally agree with that as well. I think the reality is one of the one of the real strengths of of Jane McAlevey's understanding of this difference is that she's bringing together ideas from a lot of different people and really explaining in it in a clear fashion, um, in a way that's accessible not just to people who are theorising about organising, but actually organisers themselves, activists on the ground who are doing stuff, have can easily access this information, can easily understand these these concepts. And and as Lydia said, you know, it is really important to know these the difference between between that tactic and strategy. Um because the reality is mobilising is what the trade union movement is currently doing. Mm. Um, it's being described as organising, it's being talked about as organising, but the reality is we are looking at mobilising. Um, you know, it is very rarely organising. Yes, there is some, as we talked about in the introduction, there is some organising going on. You know, we look at the Pitch House campaign or 
Deliveroo, you know, I think is a really good example of that as well. But they are small scale in the grand scheme of things. We're not look, we're not seeing mass organising going on. Um, as Jane McAlevey talks about in her book as well, a lot of that is based around experience of communists in the twenties and thirties. Mm. Not stuff that was go that's going on today, unfortunately. There's a lot of talk in in the book about kind of um, like paid organisers. And I think there's a danger that in unions like the IWW, because we don't have paid organisers and there's reasons we don't have paid organisers, that you could kind of think that some of this stuff doesn't apply. Um, that somehow, because you're all there as volunteers and notionally there's this kind of horizontal structure that um, that these issues around mobilising, these symbolic actions with you know people that are just parachuted in, um, that those things don't apply to us. But um definitely some of the things that we've been doing that we've done in london have been mobilizations and that you know not to say that um they haven't been kind of effective and you know not to say we shouldn't have done them but it's yeah like you were saying it's it's good to have a tool for us to analyze what we're doing especially because we can get a little bit complacent i think without because we don't have paid organizers we i think we think that what we're doing is organizing all the time and this is quite a good way to ground what you're doing and identify it i think that's true and actually like one like bringing it back to that point of kind of power structures a lot of mobilizing can often feel like organizing like if you are for example i don't know like getting people out to like give out leaflets or run a stall or get get people on the street to do a protest like you do have to do like a certain degree of like one-to-one conversations you're like trying to activate people you're trying to make them enthusiastic about something like you have to do practical stuff like you know scheduling when you're all going to do the tasks and you have to play that kind of role but it's that kind of idea of actually if you're not sort of directly increasing participation and that's the key isn't it like if you're not improving the level of participation in a workplace in a way that then allows you to challenge the power structures within it then that organization is only kind of you know skin deep it doesn't actually it won't provide it you, it's busy work i mean maybe mm. that's been like i don't know a bit insulting but it, it's it's keeping people busy without changing anything and also on the flip side of that as well i would also say that actually paid staff can actually be a real strength to actual organizing as well i don't think i don't think that also means that you're not organizing if you have paid staff it doesn't also mm. mean you're automatically organizing and that's clear from what mccalevy is saying as well that there is a really important role for paid staff in organizing and that's about supporting the work of members on the ground who are doing it themselves you know you are there as a support you are there to make things happen in the background to help them do things for themselves um and you know and it's i think it's fair to say that the best the best trade union officials do do that you know they work really hard to try and make that happen but often sometimes what they actually achieve is mobilizing and i don't think it's through you know it's not through any kind of negative intent or through any kind of malice or try to disempower people it's be, it often comes down to and the same from the IWW as well often comes down to real practical concerns like we need to get this thing done by x date we need yeah. to get this piece of work done if we don't get this piece of work done we don't get these people to this meeting we don't get someone attending this uh, this negotiation with the employer we don't win something in this negotiation with the employer it's going to end badly for members and we're going to have egg on our face you know it's it's always it i think i think it's almost always linked to concerns like that um obviously unfortunately there is bad cases as well where it isn't linked to that and what we're talking about sometimes may be about mm-hmm. officials protecting their position but actually you know a lot of the time we we are see you know there are people trying to organize and then accidentally stepping into mobilizing i mean it's interesting you say that because i've never really thought about it from this angle before but there is something like quite frantic about mobilizing Mm -hmm. isn't there like this sense that like you have to kind of 
always react to events. You always have to kind of do something. You always have to be seen to be doing something. It's exhausting. Something. <laughs> yeah. And actually, like, there's a certain degree of, like, patience to what is being proposed with the organizing here. Maybe, mm -hmm. like, and I suppose that's where the no shortcuts kind of thing comes from, right? The idea that there is, that actually that kind of movement and emotion that you're doing with mobilizing is kind of often running in the spot a lot of the time. And to make, like, to do substantive things takes a long time. Um, and I suppose we'll, we'll probably discuss this more at the end. It's whether, like, whether we can afford to wait is often the question that's asked, yeah. you know, because it, it is, um, it, it can be agonizingly slow organizing. Yeah. And I think it, it, you know, that's, that's very true when you look at unions dealing with high turnover industries as well so you look at usdor for example and the amount of members that they have to recruit on a constant basis to even just to stand still is unbelievable yeah. you know they're recruiting thousands of members constantly to actually just stand still and it is it's it's that it's that attitude that comes from we just have to keep going because if we don't do this mobilising, if we don't get out and recruit and just get faces there, we just get bums on seats, unless we do that, then then it all starts to fall apart. Um, and organising is long term. It is about, it is about as you've quite rightly said, changing these power dynamics. It is about altering things in the long term. And there's a nervousness about that, about that long term ideology, I think. Mm. The idea about um, mobilizing being this like quite reactive thing is interesting as well I think um, because a lot of the kind of um, grassroots unions particularly in London that have been getting kind of a lot of um, kind of a lot of attention and like well-deserved like praise over the last five years or so is is that kind of like very fast moving reactive stuff like um, it's less kind of a long term like just kind of people getting into workplaces and kind of developing these things long term and more reacting to kind of um you know dramatic pay cuts or contract changes and things um and so they've got these kind of it's interesting that it's kind of popping up in these kind of like hot shops um but yeah I think a lot of the actions that are being taken in these kind of small unions are these like very quick mobilizations and I do like that's a worry that I think I have about some of the organizing like some of the cleaner organizing for instance that like they win the dispute and that and then that's that kind of squared away yeah you kind of think like what's gonna be there in like 10 years mm. 15 years yeah like, you know because, because we there should wasn't be thinking anything... about these time scales yeah because there wasn't anything there before yeah it, it like it it kind of it happened because it was a kind of hot shot something mm. dramatic had happened and so my concern is kind of what happens after yeah the, and, you know it's resolved they've won and that's exactly right because i mean that is that's that's what's been happening in these cases is is they've just been getting the usual suspects out to show mm. their support make a scene get a lot of publicity do it extremely well yeah but then on the other Great. side of it what is left actually what's left is just the same old faces hmm. um and actually that feeds in very nicely to the next section <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that that's a good opportunity to talk about uh pizza yeah 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 so um right i'll say that again in a more serious fashion so we can actually use it <laughs> no we're definitely using the first cut <laughs> excellent yeah leave it that one. um yeah, so the, yeah, that feeds really nicely into my own experiences and I think is a shortcoming for the IWW on how we've approached things as well. So um, how I sort of broke my teeth organising for the IWW really was organising in Pizza Hut. Um, and actually we started out there, um, I started organising as a member of the IWW, I held no official position, um, I'd worked in Pizza Hut on and off, 10 years end to end, um, and I'd been organising there, I think in total for about two years, solidly, um, as a, you know, as an employee of Pizza Hut. Um, and the focus at that point was very much around 
building membership in that store where I worked and in a couple of other ones close by. It was about winning lots of small battles, um, getting new activists involved, which, you know, was worked very well. Um, and to be blunt, were actually fairly easy from within, you know, out having that grounding of being there for a long time and also knowing those people on a personal level. Um, and I think, sorry, uh, you were, one of the good ways that this played out is that you were there for every occurrence, you know, every little thing that happened, you were involved in it. Yeah. You know, you had all those opportunities to organize because you didn't have to wait two or three days until you'd heard about it. You would have been there when something happens. So for example, um, a guy who had been quite uninvolved with the union, had been a member, but hadn't really done nothing, um, found himself in trouble of getting to work late um, for a really legitimate reason. They tried to bollock him for it, and actually it gave me a really good opportunity to step in with a couple of other, couple of other members and stand up for him and have like a march on the boss there and then and do something about it. Um, you know, but on the flip side of that, you've also got all of those pressures as someone who's actually working in there. You know, it's not it's also a hell of a lot more stressful or a hell of a lot more difficult in, in a lot of other different ways. Um, and how that changed, I guess, is I, I left Pizza Hut, I stopped working for Pizza Hut and took on a, a role of an official in the IWW. So I became a regional organiser um, for the north of England. And that shifted my focus personally to, to something a bit more region-wide, building for bigger wins, breaking into new stores outside of Sheffield where we'd started um, while also and I think this is really important and something that comes into it being really distracted by uh, internal union politics you know and I think I think that's where when we're talking about that franticness that comes from uh, mobilizing I do think part of that frantic frantic attitude actually comes from our own mindset inside the inside of our own unions because we get stressed inside our own union and get and end up focusing on quick wins and quick gains. Yeah. Um, and it did make it easier once you've got that distance as well to be damaged by turnover, be damaged by things that uh, people regularly point to as issues in service sector organising. Um, it also meant that you quickly lost connection with that workforce as well once you've got that distance. And it quickly did it really did then refocus itself to become mobilising because it really changed how how the work was going on inside Pizza at that point. Um, it, it was good for the union on a wider scale because it meant that those activists who'd got involved with me also took on other roles inside the branch and, and at a national level. Um, but the bad side of that, though, it wasn't very long-term. You know, those, those people didn't stay involved forever, didn't stay involved in the long term. It really energised the Sheffield branch, and I think that still plays out to a certain extent, but um, it really made the union a third-party thing and started that distance and made it bigger and bigger as it went along. Um, so I guess coming back to the to the wider question is how do we how do we make sure we keep that organising focus? Because we, sh- we can, and also we shouldn't be discouraging our organisers and activists on the ground from taking on roles as officials. Obviously, we want people to be doing that. We want people to be working their way up inside the union and taking on different roles, taking on different stuff. But how do we make sure that that doesn't break down? Now, I think part of that is that we do need to maintain that focus of building wider committees inside workplaces. We need to be building more than just one rep or one organiser or just going in and supporting that one person, we need to be building something bigger. And I, I know it's kind of like repeating old old hat stuff about how, what organising means, but that is what we need to be, remain, that's what we need to remain focused on. That's where we need to keep our focus at building those workplace committees, not just one shop stewards. Hmm. So I wonder, because <clears throat> this, um, this story is something that, is at least from like base unions perspective mm-hmm. something that's repeated quite mm-hmm. often um i think in more recent history a, a lot of the delivery stuff has faced this challenge almost immediately like really active 
organizing committees in uh, Bristol, um, Bradford doing good work, and then stepping up often seems to be the thing that presents the challenge and then leads to kind of a weakening of that kind of organizing base ultimately. Um, and I do wonder if like, yes, yeah, scalability is often what draws us into those kind of bad tactics in the sense that like um, maintaining like an organized committee in one shot, it was hard work. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of energy and a lot of effort went into that. Um, now, for any other business, we could probably could have walked away with that as a win, right? But Pizza Hut is like a global <laughs> chain, right? So you, it, it feels like in through the kind of like absolute sheer size of that company and their power that that and I don't say this to be like cynical or insulting. It sounds pretty like mm -hmm. pathetic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's like you organized a shop. Yeah. Now in like, but we know how much effort that yeah, took, yeah. right? And we know we know how hard that was. And I think, yeah, delivery is kind of a comparable thing that you have, like, mm -hmm. to maintain that for a group of careers in a city, which is probably, like, you know, huge amounts of effort. Um, but then it's, a, yeah, it's a, not only a national company, but an international company as well. Um, so scale presents itself as a real problem, I think, given the challenges that we're facing. Um, and it is natural when we're kind of facing these behemoth like companies to think we need to try and act bigger than we are, right? We need to mobilize because that makes us look bigger or makes us mm -hmm. feel bigger, mm -hmm. um, rather than concentrating on maybe the less exciting stuff, but the stuff that actually gets us where we want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I think how this has then played out in, in other trade unions as well. And I think, you know, the other thing, it's, this is going to happen in unions like Beck2. And it's also going to happen for the bakers union as well, is that very quickly those people who have been involved in the picture house dispute, those people who have been involved in the McDonald's dispute, they are going to be, they are going to be snapped up for paid positions inside those organisations, yeah. because because they've got you know because they've got ideas because they've got because they're young because they're you know. They're much more diverse than the um, than the current stock of paid officials in those organisations, and and there's a real attractiveness to getting those people into those, and and for good reason as well. It's not it's not something that should be discouraged. You know, it's great that they want those people to take on roles, yeah. and it will happen very quickly. And obviously, people working minimum wage jobs or thereabouts will obviously want a thirty to 45 grand a year salaried position with good terms and conditions it's it you know it's completely natural that they would want that mm. but what then happens is all of those good people get sucked up into the internal union machinery and will end up doing something else or yeah. will end up do you know being somewhere else and those committees that are formed around those people with a natural talent for leadership or a natural talent for encouraging others will will be gone and those committees then fall apart yeah around them mm -hmm. so i think it's 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 um you know it it's difficult it's a difficult call isn't it because you know inside the iww we don't want to discourage people from taking on other roles inside the wider trade union movement obviously we don't want to discourage people from moving into those jobs if they if that's what they want to do um but we need to build those wider committees. Then we need to. There needs to be more strength, and I think it does come back to that point that you were making earlier. That actually, ultimately, the biggest problem here is actually that we. Oh, sorry, you didn't make that earlier. You made that before we were recording. <laughs> <laughs> what was my point before? I can't remember. Uh, about uh, the ice, you know, the the class makeup for trade unions. It's a point you're going to make in the future. I will make later, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that case, I won't, I won't make this point then because it would ruin what you were saying. <laughs> the, um, have you, sound like you a copy of me. <laughs> have you experienced anything comparable in London, Lydia, in terms of the campaigns? Like, have you found it difficult to maintain um, organising as the focus over, over mobilising? Um, I think in London we've made i think we've been making a real 
effort around strategy. Like, I mean, just over a year ago, we had a big strategy meeting um, and that's where we decided that we were going to focus on West London um, and the and an organising campaign in the factories and warehouses in West London where some um, some members worked and had been like doing a bit of organising well actually a lot of good organising um, over a number of years um, the problem I guess the problem we found is just uh I guess it's the age old problem of people are like very enthusiastic about it um initially but it's just a real um it's quite it can be a bit of a slog it's a lot of hard work like you know a lot of kind of try finding people that can do translations for leaflets and standing out in the freezing cold at like six in the morning in a bit of London which is really difficult to get to for lots of members um and actually what we could do with is like a bit of a kind of nice quick mobilization and you know to kind of win something and have something kind of exciting happen um to kind of galvanize people and it's interesting there isn't at the moment there hasn't been an opportunity for that it's at this kind of early stage and I think what's happening is really good but um it does make it difficult to kind of get keep people interested and I think that's the problem we've been having in the branch is kind of people are looking at um what's happening in some of the other um these like grassroots grassroots unions these like really inspiring demos and these ama- like amazing wins like you know transforming you know lives for sort of outsourced workers formerly outsourced workers now um at universities in London and actually what what we're doing at the moment is cold and a bit dreary and um but really important and it's I think it's like keeping the enthusiasm up for these like long-term strategic uh organizing campaigns that can be quite difficult do you think um, so obviously, like with the West London um, campaign, it was uh, well. well look, maybe you can correct me here. Are, there, are any of the people involved in the campaign like working in the in the warehouses? Yeah. In fact, there mm. are. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's what that's kind of why we went with that. There were kind of a few different options um, that people had brought along to the strategy meeting. But the thing that made this so appealing was that we have yeah a a number of and more and more um people that work in the warehouses and factories and live in the area as well so um so they kind of had a a really good sense of the conditions there they've been kind of publishing a really great newsletter called workers wild west for a number of years and so there was a really basically a lot of the research had been done um by by a couple of people in the branch And that's laid a foundation for us to kind of... So we knew where to focus, um, which has really helped. So, yeah, that's why we decided to to go with with West London. And I suppose that that then, because going back to Pizza Hut, one of the central problems, like you're saying, and and in a lot of campaigns, is, well, it's the difficulty of taking the step up, but also the fact, like you say, that the people who are central to the effort tend to be picked off or drawn elsewhere... Or just naturally leave right mm. um and so hopefully with that project those people at least provide you with like an anchor um that will keep things yeah. going in an organic way even if kind of the formal efforts are kind of kind of more sort of intense and dipping off at certain periods of time yeah and it's really interesting that you talk about like a a, a strategy meeting like that because because actually that was something we did in Sheffield as well. Um, after the the pizza campaign sort of dipped off, and um, I think it was as I was leaving as regional organizer at the time, we actually held a strategy meeting, got a lot of people from across the whole of the northern region together to to discuss what what we we're going to do. You know, because it was felt that we needed needed that kind of actual focus, that kind of. Mm there needs to be that campaigning focus. Um, and again, it came back to a similar sort of folk, uh, similar sort of ideas of actually we need to be looking where we are because there were some really great ideas, you know, like organising mm. around uh, a big curry chain up here. Um, 
our another suggestion was organising in um, agriculture, the agricultural industry, and but then the the one that that people suggested was the best one to go for was uh, re reinvesting an effort into organising in Pizza Hut. Um, again, mm. it was more like mobilising, but at least at the time it was saying right, we need to go for that one because actually. Um, that's where we do have members. That's where we've got people. You know, it's uh, the other ones are great ideas and great campaigns, but actually, we don't have anyone there. You know, it's 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 a nice theoretical idea, but actually, all we'd be doing would just be mobilising the same old faces with no mm-hmm. actual con- constituency to build on. I was just going to say that um, it's been interesting having a strategic focus because I think there was a bit of a worry in the branch that everything would be focused around West London. That's all we do. And because it's quite, um, I mean, London's massive and this is really, really far out West. Um, And so people were kind of concerned that if it wasn't viable for them to get over there, that, you know, how were they going to be involved in, in organizing more generally? Actually what's happened is it's like really helped to revive the the kind of organizing in all kinds of different workplaces. So, there was a bit of a slump and actually I think since we started the West London campaign we've been doing an awful lot more organising I mean there are other factors as well um it kind of there's a confluence of things but I do think having something that's like very focused around organising has kind of uh changed the way people think about what we should be doing and we've Mm. got lots of really promising um promising things on the horizon and and just like a lot of enthusiasm in the branch which there was a lack of before so it's um it's hard because I think at the moment we're still early stages with West London and we have you know there's a like I was saying it is it feels like a kind of a grind rather than a kind of something that's you can be kind of super enthusiastic about but it's just people are kind of a people are getting organized in the branch now which you know wasn't happening before i think part of it is just kind of we've got a bit of a model for it now well since we're sort of moved on to kind of strategy and tactics and orientation it probably makes sense to move on to the final section um which uh we titled if it's so good why don't we do it all the time um uh, organizing that is <laughs> so the because so far we've made mobilising sound really good. We have, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a lot more fun, anyway. Yeah, mm. there's there's two there's two angles that um, that I wanted to come at this. Um, the first is kind of um, to make a kind of basic kind of political point that um, the trade union leadership or trade unionism as a kind of ideological construct as a way of kind of interacting with the world as a way of organizing workers like is a social partnership model it, it kind of organizes on the basis that workers have rights are entitled to certain benefits in work that they need to be treated well but ultimately it's not transformative like it doesn't want to get rid of the the way the it doesn't want to change the way the economy is organized it doesn't want to get rid of the concepts of of a manager and a boss and a worker and it doesn't want to fundamentally shift the balance of power in the workplace and that kind of so, social partnership model tends to as a tendency and it is it, difficult because i don't want to black and white statements here because i think it there's there's not a single trade union even the most right-wing ones that fit into this absolute analysis but there's a tendency within all trade unions to push towards an area where something can be negotiated. And for that reason, like an active and a militant base is ultimately only as useful as it can give you a negotiating position. Um, and that means an ultimate limit of, of kind of rank and file is kind of you can't you can go to the negotiation negotiation table, but no further that there can't be any kind of fundamental challenge to who does the negotiation for what end does the negotiation happen um so for that reason i think there is a tendency to push towards mobilizing because uh, mobilizing presents the image of a very kind of active rank and file uh, presents the image of a very militant union but in reality as we've talked about is not 
Like it doesn't activate the base. It doesn't present any kind of transformative alternatives to like how we could organize social goods or the economy or your workplace or change the management of, um, of uh, capitalism essentially. Um, now, so I think that's, that's one thing that, that one point that has made. Why don't the trade unions do this all the time? Well, because fundamentally it's not within their ideology and it's not within their interest to do it. However, having said that, as we've, as we talked about throughout the course of this discussion, um, many well-meaning um, libertarian anti-capitalist Marxist activists will mobilize instead of organizing. And we've said ourselves that we've had the temptation to be drawn into these things or we've ended up in these places for various reasons. And I think there maybe is kind of something else going on here which is important to consider. Um, and that is that actually organizing as an alternative to mobilizing is very slow, it's very difficult, it can be very draining, and it's often, uh, as Lydia you <laughs> gave the perfect example, can be very hard and boring and a slog and cold and wet, right? So, and I, I think this is something that, so maybe maybe it's simply that this is kind of like a, a political battle that has to be won amongst like like activists and leftists that like actually this is what we should be doing or you know maybe there is kind of this thing of like is there a way that we can reformulate our models of organizing to address a sense of urgency because th this is the problem we have that we're in a, a position where a lot of people aren't in trade unions you know trade unions have been defeated historically for 20 30 years now um and yet we have like skyrocketing poverty, austerity conditions, increasingly precarious work, like we need to act. And, you know, saying, well, we might be able to do something in five years, 10 years, 15 years, doesn't seem like an adequate response if that's the time scale we're working with. Um, I, I didn't say at the beginning that I'm a history teacher, but I'm gonna use a historical example to illustrate this point, um, just to finish off. So uh, General Fabius, who was like uh, an ancient Roman general, and he's the, he's the general where the Fabians get their name from. Um, Fabians are like a socialist reform society. Um, and General Fabius said, patience is a virtue. That was his famous thing. And he had that, he had that as his slogan because um, to defeat the Carthaginian general Hannibal, um, he decided the best way of doing it was to not engage him in a, an outright battle, but to slowly wear him down with skirmishes. Um, skirmishes that would take years and years and years and years. Now, he lost his job. The Senate got rid of him. Okay, They got rid of him and they said, that you're not doing a, a good a job, this is not going quick enough. Every historian acknowledges that General Fabius had the right way of being Hannibal. But at the time, it was deemed completely inadequate. And he lost the support of everyone around him. So like, this is the thing that we don't want to turn into that general Fabius and just be like, <laughs> afterwards, afterwards we were right, but no one is <laughs> listening to us. Yeah, we're completely isolated. Cause that's, that's like the classic Marxist position anyway, isn't it, right? Knowing you're right, but no one's listening to you. <laughs> so what you're saying is everyone will think we're inadequate until maybe like 300 years of the future. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we want to avoid. So, so yeah, how can we how can we actually feed it into that sense of urgency and that need that willingness or the need to act in the now? Yeah, I think I think funnily enough, this actually reminds me very well of an article that myself and Chris wrote a number of years ago called uh, "Give Up Clastivism." And it was uh, published on. Oh, where did we? Sorry, where did we publish it? I think it went on Libcom. Libcom, sorry, yeah, yeah, which is a like a libertarian website yeah. which publishes articles and has a forum. Yeah, and um, and that was making a comment about a campaign that was basically mobilising then as well, and basically making that statement there and then, saying that you know actually what they were doing was just winning winning a lot of publicity, getting people, same old faces stood outside of a shop and, you know, was very well thought of at the time. And I think, you know, garnered a lot of attention and garnered a lot of publicity. But actually, what's the long term outcome of that been? Not not very much. Mm -hmm. you know, there there isn't there isn't organising going on in Holland and Barrett. There isn't any noticeable union presence in any of the places where they were where those 
standing outside of shops for full communisms were going on. <laughs> um, and it does play into a real dynamic in the trade union movement. And that even comes out, I think, in in Jane McAlevey's own writing when she's comparing there's a really there's a really key passage I think is really important in this where she's comparing she well she hasn't actually comparing them but when I've read it I have I've used it as a comparison between Bob Mullenkamp who was a organizing director for the national um eleven ninety nine and uh uh Bernie Minter who was uh a uh, a, a another official for a different union um uh, but it actually may have been for the same one actually but basically they um whereas bob was was focusing on saying organizing never stops we can't afford to stop you know that actually there can be a there can be a mentality fed into organizing that it's essential and that it's got to be that you've got that time pressure there as well but it is that longer term thing to where bernie then talks about maximum mobilization it's just about you know that's the real strength there and actually i think it is it is it's really that that dynamic is really real that actually um the difference between organizing and mobilizing isn't realized but actually there is a real dynamic there inside the trade union movement where people will just want to get faces out there will want to hold those protests will want to make it seem like there's lots of people around even if there's not necessarily the 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 grounding to it whereas others will say you know no, we need to focus on this we need to focus on we need to focus on building in a workplace hmm. and as we sort of admitted to in the in the introduction the idea that organizing can be got round can be got round if we've got authentic voices if we've got those people there that is definitely there and i've definitely experienced that a lot mm. as an official uh for you know for for every union i've worked for where you know people always want to make sure there's an authentic voice speaking about a campaign and you know that's not a bad thing they're not saying that because they're they're trying to hide the fact that they don't have organizing on the ground they're saying that because they genuinely want someone in that workplace to have their say but that doesn't necessarily then translate into them having their say about what's going on in that campaign, what's going on in that workplace, what kind of organising you're doing, what kind of industrial action you're looking at. You know, like all of those things don't necessarily connect up. Those authentic voices don't necessarily also have power. And I think I think that's where the problem is. And and it's partly a shift in members' relationship with their unions that has caused that. Because actually officials should be shit scared of their members i love having workplaces where i have to ask to go in that is the way it should be it should not be that reps and members are like subservient to an official it's completely the other way around and it should always be thought about that way Mm. Um, and the best branches in any union operate that way that they have a they have a positive but adversarial relationship with their officials and it should be like that and we should encourage that because actually that's that's members with power and members with the ability to hold their union and their employer to account at the same time so you're saying you're kind of almost saying that it's almost like this this kind of so the way that we make it more urgent is this needs to be transformed into a, a movement at the base mm. of the existing trade union movement Definitely. like as in and that's how yeah because i think that's I, often we we kind of often uh, perceive things just in terms of our own organizing right but actually there's a whole trade union movement out there mm. that's that's engaged with various different practices most of which are kind of incredibly depressing and <laughs> energy draining um and actually yeah there maybe there should be more engagement with that from this perspective yeah yeah hmm. i think in terms of how do we kind of when things feel like so politically urgent like in people's workplaces with you know things like zero hour contracts and you know other kinds of kind of precarious work on the rise but then also just kind of like cuts and and things like that that um that's where um, Jane McAlevey's concept of kind of whole worker organising is quite 
interesting because I think obviously you know the IWW our focus is and should be on workplace organizing but um I think all of us you know we understand the links between kind of low pay and and housing and um you know cuts to services and cuts to benefits and things like that I think being kind of workplace organizing can be a little bit uh, invisible especially when it is organizing rather than these kind of big mobilizations and I think um, being quite like vocal about the links between kind of what happens in your workplace and what happens in your community is a way of kind of um, making people feel like something's happening and that they can and should get involved with it so I think kind of breaking like our focus in the IWW should be on the workplace, but kind of making these links kind of back to people's communities. And I think that will I mean, I think that makes people feel like, yeah, something is being done about the things that they're, you know, experiencing every day. Because I think work there's people feel like there's a high barrier to entry for workplace organising. <laughs> um, which like <laughs> We probably don't help that impression, do we? <laughs> we make it sound really entertaining. Yeah, yeah, you have to be yeah. able to stand in West London in yeah. the rain at six o'clock in the morning. How difficult is that? <laughs> sounds great. Sounds great. I'm really into it. <laughs> you have to have a really good quality coat, like good quality outerwear is key. Oh um, my God, we should do Max. That yeah, <laughs> branded Max. Um <laughs> But I think a lot of people, um, I think people would appreciate the, these links being made and I think it would be a kind of good way to to kind of, not just to bring people in, but to kind of deepen the organising that's happening. And I mean, in West London, what's kind of happening alongside um, the, the stuff that's focused around the factories and the warehouses is um, a solidarity network. So... Um, it's predominantly migrant workers um, in those factories and warehouses um, and they have problems with their visa status, with their landlords, um, all kinds of things um, that often cross over and like intersect with what's happening in their workplaces as well. And so what um, the kind of the crew that are kind of living in West London have been really good at doing is... Um, it's kind of helping people through that solidarity network and making the links between, you know, what they're experiencing from their landlord and what's happening in their workplace. I think also like those those spheres are, are like a source of power as well. Mm. Importantly, like if you can, yeah, I mean, like you, you have a, a degree of economic and destructive power with your landlord, like in, in the kind of community spheres, um, distribution of food, um, uh, distribution of care, and childcare, like all of these things yeah. um, create a web, um, but which potentially could be used as a basis of kind of social power that feeds mm. very, very well into the workplace. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Like in, in times of struggle, particularly, these things organically happen anyway. Like if you look at kind of what was happening in South Yorkshire during the miners' strike, like it, it was women, it was, it was whole families were mobilized. Um, to support uh, striking families so I think naturally naturally those things happen in times mm. of, of struggle and it's good to cultivate those as a source of kind of strength and, and maybe something that can like you say meet the urgency of of what's happening yeah and, and I think um, a strong community base is exactly why previous models of organizing have worked because they've been able to be long term, because they've had such a strong community base, you know, like 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 Jay McAleefy talks about in her own book. She talks about communists. She talks about civil rights movement. You know, you could also talk about the Black Panthers, as you rightly pointed out to you know the NUM and organising among mining communities. You know, these are all really great examples of organising with unbelievably strong bases and. And maybe you know maybe that's if we're talking about what's what's not working at the minute. I, I think it is that you know that mm. there isn't that base. Yeah. There isn't that base that 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 embedded um, embedded solidarity that embedded community 
you know, and actually that's the sort of thing that takes decades to build. You know, you don't just get that overnight. Um, but actually having an active role in a community and having a home there, I think is, is, yeah. is where it starts. Well, that seems like a good natural point to bring this discussion to a close and also talk about the theme of the next podcast, which we're kind of moving on to already, um, which is we're going to be talking about what does a successful trade union movement actually look like? And we've, we've kind of already talked about some examples of past struggles that seem to be good models. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that as well. So uh, this was the first New Syndicalist podcast in our new series called Talking Shop. Um, so should we all go say bye individually? I don't know whether we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether you do that. And that's how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> <laughs> we need like a really cheesy sign off. <laughs> It's oh, that's how capitalism me. crumbles. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's goodbye for me. It's good time. Yeah. We, um, need to, we need to agree on that. Yeah. We need to work we'll, on we'll, that. We'll, we'll, we'll work that out. For by now, way, we'll just... By the way, we should include all of this chat. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> Outtakes. We'll, we'll just say, uh, solidarity forever. Keep the struggle up, fellow workers. And that's how the cookie uh, crumbles. And that's how the cookie crumbles. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.